All right, everyone. This is Dr. Elizabeth Granier at St. Louis Community College at the Merrimack campus. Uh, histology and tissues are chapter four content. That is for somewhere around uh, week two um, of our course for our Bio 207 classes. So as you can see, again, the two main books we're working off of are the Anatomy and Physiology 9th edition, which is the orange book, or you might find that you've been upgraded and you got the new book, which is the 10th edition. Okay, so that is where this content comes from, and again, it's from Chapter 4. So our objectives for histology are that we can describe the structure and location of the tissues of the body, and we can explain their functions. Now, in keeping with what then are the tissues of the human body, the human body has four tissue types. We have epithelial tissues, which are defined as cells that have combined into a group of cells that work to cover um, surfaces of the body, line any tubes or chambers of the body, so they are lining your airways, they're lining your blood vessels, they're lining the chambers of the heart. And there is also a group of these cells that differentiate somewhat from the um, protective type cells and form glands. And so glands are typically going to be cells that surround a little bit of a tubing system and then put into that tubing system secretion. So when we think about the glands of the body, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the pancreas, those glands are made up of epithelial tissue. So cells that have differentiated into becoming epithelial tissue. And our skin, our epidermis of our skin, our endothelial or the cells that line your blood vessels. The, and your heart chambers, the atria and the ventricles, the cells that line your um, air sacs, your alveoli, the cells that line your airways, those are all epithelial cells but fall in the category of epithelium, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about in this lecture and most of what this lecture is going to cover is the epithelial tissues. And we're going to go through all the different categories. We're going to go through the characteristics, the location, the sources, and then the special features that are associated with um, each of the categories. Now, epithelial tissue is not the only type of tissue. And connective tissue is the next category. And in many ways, connective tissue is like this big collective um, of a bunch of different kind of characteristic type tissues. The, the main cohesive thing of connective tissue is that the tissue has some non-living background material and suspended in that non-living background material it are the cells of some of the different cells of the body. And the cells can be a bunch of different types. So you could have... Um, cells that are located, many different white blood cells in the same area as a different type of resident fibroblast or fibrocyte cell, okay? So the, there's a bunch of different cell populations, a bunch of different potential cells that live in a variety of background material that is composed of a few different maybe proteins, water, ions, and different content. Now, our fourth tissue type is going to be muscle tissue. Now, we're not talking just about skeletal muscle. We're talking about all the cells of the body that have this characteristic of being able to beat. So muscle, when you talk about it as a tissue, is skeletal muscle cells and all of the skeletal muscle cells combining into the skeletal muscle organs. And then you have the cardiac muscle cells, which collectively form the heart organ. And the third part of the muscle tissue is your smooth muscle cells that combine and form um, muscular linings of tubes and passageways, and they assist with mixing and pushing through whatever that tube or passageway has to push through, either liquid or, or more solid contents, okay? So the big 
cohesive factor that brings all muscle cells together is every muscle cell has some type of arrangement of proteins. They have some special organelles within that allow the proteins to interact in a way that the cell will change its shape. And when it changes its shape, it beats in the manner of speaking. Okay? It contracts. All right? The last tissue type is going to be nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is going to be cells within the tissue that have an ability to carry electrical impulses. We also call them action potentials. So the cells here, there are support cells, which are all about keeping the main functional cell, the neurons, alive. And the neuron then will allow for electricity in the body, in a sense, across this membrane of the cell to move from one location to another very quickly and at that target location change the signal and propagate it and move it on to the next cell or to the effector. Okay? So again, our four tissue types, epithelial tissue is going to be all of our glands of our body and all of our protective epithelium, all of our protective covering cells. Connective tissue is kind of a catch-all category. It's going to be a lot of different things, bone, blood, cartilage, uh, tendons, ligaments, um, the internal part of the skin, fat. There's a lot of different kind of the kind of characteristics that fall into here, but the main cohesive factor is all of the cells that are in this tissue in some way, shape, or form live in a non-living background material. Okay? Muscle are going to be any cells that have this ability to contract, and when they contract, that means they could beat, like in the case of the heart. They can generate a force in the skeletal muscle and move. Um, for smooth muscle, they might change the diameter or change the length of the vessels. Okay? And nervous tissue is cells supported by other cells, but the main functional cell has an ability to conduct electrical impact. Uh, signals, conduct electrical impulses, right? Now, epithelial tissue, two broad categories. There's the part of epithelial tissue that is about protecting underlying tissue. So it's going to be part of the immune system, and it's going to be part of our defense that tries to keep things in and keep things out. Now, to have an effective covering, to have an effective barrier, we tend to want certain characteristics to be universally found in these tissues. The first characteristic is we want the cells to be very closely interconnected to each other. And by being connected and touching to each other, there's less gaps or spaces for items to leak in or items to fall out. Right? So one of the things when you look at epithelial cells is you're tending to see that epithelial cells are going to touch the cells around them, helping to create an effective cellular barrier. Now, the cells are going to then have part of the cell exposed to the outside of the body or exposed to the inside of a vessel or the inside of a cavity or the inside of a passageway. So what the membrane exposed to that passageway looks like versus what the membrane anchoring the cell to the underlying body and tissue are going to give the cell what's known as these polarity, these different portions or sides. So when we think about um, our skin cells, the, scales, the cell surface that is towards the outside of the body is going to be very different than what the cell looks like anchored to the other cells beneath it. And that difference means that maybe the cell towards the outside is, um, doesn't have as many uh, membrane proteins to interact with signaling markers. Um, and the inside of the cell that's touching the underlying tissue maybe has a lot of anchoring type proteins to help hold it in that spot. Okay. Um, so when we talk about the epithelial cells lining your small intestines, you know, the, the part of the cell that's going to push into the inside of the small intestines is going to interact with food. And we want that cell to maybe have a lot of membrane and proteins embedded in the membrane interacting with the food. So you might 
find that those cells have a lot of microvilli, the membrane making hills and valleys. So lots of interaction can take place with food. And lots of proteins embedded in that membrane pull the food particles from the outside of the cell into the cell. And then the anchoring part of the cell, the lumen side of the cell that's attaching, keeping the cell attached to the, um, the vessel wall is going to, again, have a lot of anchoring proteins that just help the cell not be pulled off or ripped off as food moves through the tube. Okay? So there is what's known as an apical and a lumen surface. The apical surface is normally pushing into the open space and may have a different feature and characteristic and protein membrane content than what is on the lumen side of the cell, which is holding the cell to the, um, the tissue, holding the cell to become part of that barrier of the body. All right, and again, the base of our cells, the cells have to be attached to underlying tissue, and that tissue is normally a basement membrane. And we're going to learn most of the time our basement membranes is a type of loose connective tissue. It's a membrane that allows capillaries uh, to kind of be embedded within. It has a small little cellular population to lay down some proteins to give a little bit of oomph to the um, to the matrix, the background environment, but it's it's a kind of a loosey goosey, spider webby type, um, gluey material. Okay. Now, these cells for epithelium in many cases are going to be a barrier. They are going to form a you know a rope or a line of um, cells that protect things from getting into the body or getting out of the body. So one of the things we sacrifice with an epithelial layer is we don't want vessels to push in between the cells. We don't want to make room for vessels to basically break down the integrity of the cell-to-cell -cell content. So because of that, epithelial cells are termed A without vascularity, so avascular. So when you look at tissue, if you see a bunch of cells closely interconnected and you do not see any blood vessels, any pushing in between and open spaces created by blood vessels, you're probably looking at an epithelial tissue. Now, these cells still need to make ATP, still need to get oxygen from the blood, still need to get glucose and fats from the blood to be able to convert to energy inside their mitochondria, and they're still creating waste products, carbon dioxide, urea, ammonia. And so those items have to be brought to these cells by blood and taken away from these cells by blood. So what we're going to find is while there's no blood vessel physically touching cells, embedded in between the cells, the blood vessels will be in the underlying basement membrane. And again, I told you it's kind of a, a loose, goosey network of like spider webs. And think about the open space of that spider web. Little capillaries can be formed and can be in the, those spots. So for the cells of the basement that are holding onto the basement membrane, they are the ones closest to the blood vessels. And so they are the cells that tend to be the most alive and tend to be able to have ready access to um, oxygen and nutrients and dump their waste products. For cells that are further away from the basement membrane, further away in a multilayered membrane of um, or multilayer epithelial tissue, we're going to find that as the cells move further away from the blood supply in the basement membrane, they are going to undergo a slow cell death. So they might not be able to get as much energy. They might not be able to get as much um, nutrients. They might not be able to get as much oxygen. And so the cells that are being pushed away from the basement membrane are going to be slowly dehydrating, slowly shrinking, and eventually dying. And so when you look at the surface of your skin, you actually are seeing a bunch of dead cells. They have flattened out. They have basically lost all their water. They are no longer capable of doing much, really, but just sitting there. And the little bit of oil on our skin kind of keeps them somewhat pliable. And remember, you are constantly shedding these dead skin cells. And that's where dust comes from. So as you exfoliate or as you slowly slough off the dead skin, that's becoming small little flaky dead cells suspended in the air that becomes some of the dust that accumulates on our furniture, on our fans, and elsewhere. Okay? Now, epithelial cells are going to interact with the outside environment. 
So they are the cells that are most likely to get damaged by UV radiation. They are going to be the cells that are most likely to get attacked by bacteria, virus, and other parasites that are introduced by the food we eat or the water we drink or the um, dirt or mud that we interact with um, with our skin. So these cells are constantly under a lot of stress. They're under stress from fluid flowing through and the stresses of pressure and distension. They are under a lot of stress from the outside environmental factors. And so what we find is epithelial cells have to constantly be replaced and replenished. And with that comes the cells of the basement membrane are constantly going through cell mitosis. They are constantly undergoing a rate of the daughter cells being created to replace the cell that's lost and the daughter cell that just gave up its life, you know. And so epithelial cells have a very high rate of mitosis. And because of that, sometimes when you look at the lining of your digestion, uh, your small intestines, it might look like they're multicellular, but what you're really potentially seeing is just some of the states of cell differentiation and cell um, division occurring, OK? Now, epithelia are the protective layers, OK? And very importantly, all epithelia, you're looking for cells attached to each other, one part of the cell exposed, one part of the cell anchoring, and there's some difference there. Bases, the base part of the cell is underlining basement membrane. That's where the capillaries are. That's where the um, connective tissue holds it to the body. All right? There are no blood vessels in between epithelial cells. They're only in the basement membrane. And cells constantly have to regenerate, undergo a high mitosis rate to constantly replenish the damaged and sloughing off cells that happen on a normal um, basis. Glands are going to be very similar in a lot of ways, except they're not there primarily to protect um, the, the tube that they might be surrounding, OK? So glands are going to be these epithelial cells that come together and form this little globular mass. And in this globular mass, the cells are going to form little tubes that interconnect into one big duct. And that duct can then push out secretions to the body um, in different ways. So think of your salivary glands. You have these large little blobs of cells, known as epithelial cells, that are nice and touching and, and kind of squished together. And they are going to surround themselves around a little bit of a tubing. And those tubes are going to, like a funnel, kind of connect into one another. And eventually, that funnel is going to push saliva into our mouth. right? And the saliva content is going to come up at times and go down at times. And that, again, those cells are going to increase their secretions of watery sliminess into the tube or decrease the amount they put into that tube in a given second. All right? Your sweat glands and your oil glands in your skin are also glands. So again, when we look at the gland, we are going to see cells that are touching each other, forming a little bit of a tubing network that connects into each other and eventually has an opening where secretions are pushed out. And then sweat and oil gland case, that duct or tubing is pushed out in some way, shape, or form. So the material that gets pushed out gets onto the surface of our skin, OK? All right. Glands, like epithelium, cells will touch. Cells kind of have a polarity. There's a small part of the cell that is connected in some way, shape, or form to a tube. So there is a part of the cell that has an exposed kind of surface. And there's a part of the cell connected to a basement membrane. There's no blood vessels in between the cells. All of the blood vessels are in that basement membrane. So it is avascular. And like protective tissues, epithelial uh, glandular cells do have a high rate of mitosis. So when we think about breast cancer, mammillary glands, pancreatic cancer, adrenal glands, uh, many of your glandular cancers are just as deadly and as terrible and as um, high rate of incidence as 
your skin cancers, right? Because they, in many ways, come from the same tissue type, epithelial tissues, okay? Okay, when we look at our protective layers, our protective layers, we are going to first look and see, is it a single layer of cells providing this kind of protective fencing, or do we have a multiple layer? If we have single layers of cell protecting the outside environment from the inside environment, we tend to call that a simple epithelium. So simple epitheliums, we're going to find where we want to have a protection. We want to have a little bit of a fence, but we don't want there to be a big, thick fence. So we want the whatever is able to cross the fence because it's a small particle. We want it to have a small distance to move across. So simple epitheliums are going to be in areas where we want protection, but we don't necessarily want a thick in the protection. We want just a thin layer of like plastic wrap to kind of separate, you know, two items from each other, right? When we look at areas where we want more robust thickness, right, instead of having plastic bags separating our furniture from each other when we're moving, sometimes we put blankets, a thicker padding, so we get a little bit more thickness in the protection. That is going to be multi-layered cells, and again, we're going to call that stratified epithelium. So when you're looking at a slide and you see that the, the exposed outside environment versus the internal environment shows a large thickness to it, and the thickness is because of multiple cell layers, you would be looking at a stratified epithelium. When you look at an exposed area and then you very quickly see the internal environment and there's just a very like maybe pancake type thin cell kind of being that barrier, that fence between where the outside environment is versus where the inside environment is located, you're looking at a simple epithelium, okay? So that's the first kind of way we start to look at epithelium. Is there multiple layers of cells or single layers of cells? The next part of looking at the epithelium is to then look at the cells in particular, their size, their morphology, their shape, okay? If the cell looks like a flat pancake, Right? It looks like it's been squashed. It's a fried egg. So there's a little bit of an area where the nucleus is rising, but for the most part, it's a very thin, just cytoplasmic membrane material that separates the outside versus the inside. All right? Those type of cells we call squamous cells, and I think of being squashed. All right? So the, the cell is a cell that has been squashed and flattened down into a flat cell. There's maybe a little rise at one part where the nucleus is located, but for the most part, we have a lot of these very thin cells that provide a, a barrier where there's outside environment versus inside environment, but the cells are very thin, right? Simple cuboidal, the cell is going to look like a cube, so that's why it gets its name as cuboidal. All right, so the cells are very much little square shapes. Um, they are going to, again, simple, single layer, but they're all these little squares that line up nicely next to each other. All right? Simple columnar, we're going to see the cells are more rectangles, but they're long and they're skinny. So the width is the length. So they're long, so there's a big difference between where they, the part of the membrane is pushing into the internal environment or the external body versus where the anchoring part is located, right? And so they have columns. Now, pseudo-stratified. So pseudo is kind of like somewhat faking you out, stratified. So if we break the word down, this type of simple epithelium is technically single layered, right? But it kind of looks like it's multi-layered, okay? So it, it has this ability to, under the naked eye, not a trained eye, it might look multi-layered, but technically speaking, it's a single layer. But it gets the name pseudo because it looks multi-layered when it's not, all right? It's pseudo-stratified columnar. So typically you're going to see the cells are long and skinny, 
but at the same time, they are going to have this linear weaving. Think of it as like seaweed, and the seaweed can kind of crisscross, and as it crisscrosses, it makes a motif of looking multicellular when, in fact, it is single cellular, but the nucleuses are going to not all line up, and they're going to be all kind of all over the place, giving the appearance of multiple cell layers. Okay? All right. So simple, always single layered. If it's simple squamous, single layered, squash cells, flat pancakes. Simple cuboidal, single layer, cube looking. Simple columnar, simple layer, one layer, long and skinny. Pseudostratified columnar, it gives an appearance of multi-layer. And again, for a trained eye, you can tell that it's maybe that transition of where stratified squamous of the mouth is trying to get eventually in the lungs to simple squamous. And so for an area in the trachea, there's this transition to pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Okay? So sometimes we'll see this show up um, in some of those transition sites where we need to go from multi-layer back to single layer. Okay? Now, for the multi-layer, for the most part, we have a great example of stratified squamous being the epidermis of the skin. Now, multi-layered. The majority of the layers will be squashed, flat, dead cells. But not every layer has to be squat, flash, dead, right? Some of the innermost basement membrane layers might be cuboidal, might be a little columnar. But what happens is, because it's avascular and because the cells get pushed further away from the basement membrane as division occurs, and they move further away, they dehydrate, they get less nutrients, they can't be as functional, they start to undergo death. And as they die, they dehydrate, flatten out, and they're flaky cells. So stratified squamous is going to have a lot of layers of cells that are dead and squashed looking, and then some alive layers which are avascular, regenerating, and might be cuboidalish, columnarish. Right? But it gets its name because it's multi-layered, and the largest population of cells are actually dead squashed cells. Okay? Stratified cuboidal, normally you might see two or three layers, but unlike the skin, this is not like huge numbers of layers. So it might just be a few cu cuboidal cells stacked on top of each other. Stratified columnar, again, somewhat like pseudostratified columnar, it's, it's um, maybe two, maybe three layers, but not that many because the columnar already gives a lot of width, so we don't need to add more and more width. But you sometimes see that it can be found maybe where we're beginning to see that transition from like the large intestines. Eventually, you want to get to the rectum and anus is stratified squamous, so multilayered. So there's somewhat of a transition time where the simple columnar becomes a little multicolumnar before it becomes stratified squamous. Okay? Transitional is unique in that this epithelial cell type is multilayered, but the cells will be a different shape depending upon what's going on with the organ that it's located within. So this is your bladder. So your bladder, when it's not full, is a smaller chamber, and so with that, the elastic recoil of the bladder, it kind of collapses into a smaller shape, and the cells that are lining the inside of there end up being more like poofy cells, like balloonish, circular, globular cells. When the bladder starts to fill and the fluid accumulating in the bladder starts to push and open the, the chamber somewhat, the innermost lining of the cells as the, you know, stretches occurring on the organ stretch out into more flattened, pancakey cells. So it gets its name transitional because the cells are going to be a changing shape depending upon the organ's elastic or stretch occurring. Right? So this is the bladder for the most part. Right? So again, looking at this in picture form, epithelium, you are going to see that all of the cells have these five characteristics, or all the tissues typically have 
some type of cell touching cell. So not a lot of space in between. That's part of the reason why it's effective as a barrier. So a fence that has slats touching each other is more effective at keeping your dog from leaving your backyard than a fence that has, you know, open spaces that the dog can squeeze through. Okay? So a more effective fence is cells touch. Cells touch. So something can't get in between them and push through. The polarity comes from the, what's exposed to the outside environment versus what is holding to the inside environment. We're, we'll be a different population of proteins and maybe some um, signaling markers, right? And so the polarity exists. We don't want to give up space in between the cells because we want that effective barrier. So there's no blood vessels in this tissue. All of the blood vessels are going to be underneath in the basement membrane, also known as the lamina. Right, so the underlying connective holding tissue. That's where your capillaries and your blood vessels run. Right? And all of these cells undergo a high metabolic overturning rate because as these cells interact with this outside environment, they get damaged, they get stressed, and they might need to be released or recycled and to order to do that. If one cell dies and gets pulled off, another cell very quickly needs to take its place. So cells have to undergo a lot of mitosis. All right? Again, point your attention to simple columnar. Usually you're going to see the nuclei line up. And so it is going to show us that pretty uniform column single cell. Pseudostratified columnar, the cells, again, will kind of squeeze like seaweed, like water plants together. And so as they squeeze and push on each other, the nuclei are going to find different locations in the height of the column. And it gives the appearance that maybe this is multilayer, but what in fact is happening is the long kind of tree branch of the cell is kind of getting pushed and bent around and the nucleus is finding a spot. So it gives an appearance of multicellular, but it really isn't, right? Again, transitional, the cells can transition from being puffy clouds to flattened cells depending upon the state of the bladder. Is it full and stretched or is it empty and small? Right? And stratified squamous, most of the cells are flattened pancakes, but not all. And the cells located closest to the basement membrane might be columnar, cuboidal in shape, and they're that way because they have the better access to the nutrients, the water, and um, life being able to stay alive. And as they fall away from that basement membrane, they undergo slow death and flatten out and dehydrate. Okay. So where can we find simple squamous epithelium? Right? So we're going to find this type of barrier in places where we want a protect, protection of cells, but we don't want to give up a lot of space. We don't want it to be a thick space. So the best place we're going to see this is in the alveoli of the lungs. You want to have a physical barrier between what's in the air and what's in your bloodstream. All right, and so what we're going to find is there's going to be a layer of simple squamous epithelium lining the lungs. And it's going to help prevent um, particulate or ash or dust or things that you breathe in that maybe don't get caught by your mucous membranes in your nose and make their way to the alveoli. Right? And they are going to help prevent those items from hopefully getting into your bloodstream. Right? Now, it's not, an, it's not a, a barrier that prevents oxygen and carbon dioxide to move, but it is a barrier that tries to prevent, you know, silicon and certain other particles or metals that are aerosolized from getting into the bloodstream, right? Same thing with the capillaries. At some point, your capillaries want to be a very thin layered vessel. And we want there to be the potential for a little barrier to keep blood technically inside the capillary vas vasculature tree, but we want the contents of what's in the blood to be able to freely somewhat move towards the cells in the 
outside area, and whatever the cells have waste product wise, we want those molecules to be able to be come into the bloodstream. So our bloodstream is in many cases going to be uh, lined by a simple squamous epithelium. Now, to kind of differentiate all the different examples of simple squamous epithelium, we start to give them different names. So the name for the innermost lining of all of your blood vessels and the innermost lining of the heart, which is continuous with the blood vessels, all of that is called endothelium. And that's this term here. Okay? And that's what I'm showing you here. There's endothelium right here. And this endothelium will connect into the aorta, will connect into all the arteries, and eventually all the capillaries. All right? In the lungs, the simple squamous epithelial lining of the lungs is actually known as uh, pneumocytes type 1 cells, right? And sometimes you'll hear people, when they have lung cancer, they will tell you they have a sarcoma, a simple or a squamous cell sarcoma or carcinoma. And so what they're trying to tell you in that pathology report is the cells that have become tumorous and started inappropriately making a cancerous mass are the squamous cells lining the alveoli, right? Another place you're going to find simple squamous epithelium is going to be in the membranes of our serous membranes. So our visceral and parietal pericardial membranes, our visceral and parietal peritoneal membranes, and our visceral and our parietal uh, pleural membranes. And they are simple squamous cells with underlying connective tissue. And the simple squamous component of this membrane is known as the mesothelium. And it never fails. At some point, you end up hearing that commercial of, do you suffer from mesotheliomia? Call the lawyers of Krugen and blah, blah, blah. And what they're saying is, for some people, the mesothelium becomes cancerous and mesotheliomia uh, and starts to divide inappropriately and not work, and that leads to problems with if the mesothelium of the lungs got affected, then a lung issue. If it's the heart, it's a heart issue. If it's in the GI tract area, the peritoneum, then it's a peritoneal lung abdominal issue. Okay? So those are all your examples of simple squamous epithelium. You're, when you look at them in a flat view, again, a lot of pancakes touching each other. When you look at them in cross section, the pancakes touching each other, but they're very thin. There are no blood vessels. The blood vessels are in the underlying connective tissue. And you just see that they have a little bit of cytoplasm, and they have a little nucleus maybe at somewhere at some point pushing through. Right? In your book, they'll show you a little bit more about friction, control, functions, and the other locations. Okay? Now, stratified squamous epithelium, the best example is your epidermis of your skin. All right, so the epidermis of your skin is going to be multi-layered, so it's stratified, and the majority of those layers are full of dead cells. So look at all those dead cells that have flattened out. So we see that the cells are not touching each other, the cells are interconnected, and there's a part of the cell that's exposed to the outside of the body, and that outside of the body part of the cell might be very different from what is then connected to the underlying tissue. Cells are going to be constantly falling off, damaged, dying, so the regeneration of the cells at the basement membrane to replenish and replace the cells being lost are at a very high rate, okay? Now, with the skin, we're going to learn that these cells in the stratified squamous layer are going to, at a certain point in time, start to make a high amount of a certain protein. Right? And that protein they're going to make is known as keratin. And keratin is going to give these cells the ability that when they're dead and the water is gone, the cell kind of still has a very tough exterior and inner protein content. Okay? And the higher the amount of keratin, the harder the cell when it's dead. So think about your nails. The dead part of your nails is basically dead keratinized cells that are still connected to each other until you break them, cut them off, or they fluff off themselves, all right? So keratin makes things waterproof, makes things hard. So your hair that you see is technically dead hair. It's dead keratinized cells still connected to each other, all right? So keratin is a protein you are going to find inside cells of a stratified squamous um, tissue type, 
right? And it's one of those unique little characteristics that we'll find that we don't see in simple cuboidal or simple columnar. All right, and it comes back to, in many cases, stratified squamous epithelium is going to be found in your mouth. It's going to be found in your anus, in your vagina, in your urethra. It's found in holes that give access to things for them to come into the body or for things to come out of the body. And where we know things come in and out, there's a higher risk, a higher statistical probability that pathogens try to come in and out in those locations as well. Thus, why we want more cell protecting the system. Okay. All right. Cuboidal epithelium, in many cases, is going to be your glandular epithelium. All right. So many of your glands are composed of cuboidal epithelium. Okay. And therefore, many times when we think about sweat glands and we look at the gland anatomy in a microscope, you're going to see cuboidal cells are going to form a little circle around a tube, and that tubes all interconnect eventually to a duct, and that duct pushes the contents that these cells push in here um, out to the mouth for salivary glands, out of the breast for mammillary glands, out of the skin for sweat glands, etc. Okay? Now, other cuboidal locations are going to be the nephron of your kidneys. And so the tube that is the nephron that allows fluid to be eventually made into what will become urine uh, is going to be lined by simple cuboidal cells, right? So that's one location where the cuboidal cells are a protective lining of a tube specific towards bringing things in and out. But in many cases, your glands are made up of cuboidal epithelial cells and they line these specialized ducts that connect into each other towards a few openings that then release the contents um, from the cells, from the secreting goblet cells, which you'll see here, these specialized gland cells that then make breast milk, make sweat, make oil, make the sweaty uh, salivary contents that you then see as saliva, okay? Transitional epithelium, and again, in your book, they can go through this. I think um, somehow when I changed the slides to white, the, the text was lost. But the simple, the transitional epithelium is in the bladder. And again, it gets its name because it's multilayered. So the urine and the acidity of the urine is not potentially damaging internal features of your body or tearing away and eating acid erosion of cells and content. All right, but the cells are going to be a different shape depending upon if the bladder is full and stretched or poofy and not stretched, okay? Your columnar epithelium is going to play a big role in your GI tract, um, a little bit in your airways uh, as well, but your GI tract. So the, the main part of the GI tract is to digest and then absorb key nutrients for your energy-making needs of the body. All right, your metabolism of your cells. So I need to make proteins. I need to take in amino acids. I need to make some energy. I need to take in glucose and fat. So simple columnar, pseudostratified columnar, and stratified columnar are going to be throughout that system. You're going to tend to see simple columnar mostly in the stomach, small and large intestines. But you're going to see the esophagus is going to have a big transition phase. So the esophagus is going to be made up of some stratifiedness because it's connected to the mouth, which is stratified squamous, squamous. And eventually, at the very bottom, closest to the stomach, the esophagus is simple columnar. So as it, you move through the thoracic region of your body, your esophagus is undergoing the innermost lining of it, a change from stratified towards single. Same thing in the large intestines before you kick out the fecal matter and as you store fecal matter in your rectum, uh, you're going to transition from simple columnar to eventually stratified squamous and so in doing so you're going to find there's some pseudostratified columnar and stratified columnar epithelium, okay? So again, the big difference is one, pseudostratified versus simple the nuclei line up in a simple columnar. The nuclei are kind of displaced. There's a little bit more of a um, flag, you know, ribbon 
intertwining, interacting this to this, so the nuclei get pushed around, giving the appearance of multilayered. Right? In stratified columnar, again, you're going to see that some one to two of the layers might look columnar. Maybe the columnar layer is the innermost. Maybe it's the exterior. Um, but what's happening is the inner basement membrane might be more cuboidal, and that's where the um, regeneration, the avasculature, same of those principles apply. Okay? And again, it's a lot of this is found as we transition to potentially what will become an opening or near an opening where we want stratified squamous epithelium. Okay? For glandular epithelium, again, glands are categorized as one of two mechanisms. If they make something that needs to travel in the bloodstream, they're an endocrine gland. So the pancreas makes insulin and glucagon, which goes into the blood supply. It's an endocrine gland. But the pancreas makes secretions that get pushed into the small intestines to help us break down lac lactose. So we need the lactase enzyme. It helps us break down um, fats with pancreatic lipase. So part of the pancreas is also a exocrine gland, right? Exocrine glands make a secretion in a duct. This duct is typically maybe connected to the stomach, to the small or large intestines, and those secretions get pushed into that. Or it can be like the mammillary glands, your sweat glands, your uh, oil glands, your earwax glands, where the gland makes a secretion, and that secretion is put onto the surface of the body or the surface of the chamber passageway. Okay. For endocrine glands, they put their secretions into the bloodstream. So these cells, in some ways, are not going to use their apical surface to secrete. They're going to use their lumen surface to secrete. All right? So when we look at for the exocrine glands, when a cell is going to make a secretion, it makes a secretion in one of three ways. It can make a secretion where it just pushes out some proteins, some ions, and some water follows by osmosis, but the cell stays intact. All right, and so these are like your, um, your serous membranes. They make a little bit of some protein and ions get pushed out into the chamber between the two uh, visceral parietal membranes. And as ions get into that environment, water by osmosis flows, and it makes a little wet um, secretion. Right? But the cells don't technically lose any pieces or parts of themselves. And that's known as a merocrine secretion. Right? So the cells just push out some molecules, and because molecules increase in population, water wants to flow and follow, and so we make a watery secretion that way, right? Now, if the cell in making its secretion actually exfoliates part of itself, it doesn't lose a large part of its nucleus or its, uh, or its cytoplasm, it just kind of breaks off pieces and parts of its cytoplasm, that kind of gland is going to be an apocrine secretion. And an example of the apocrine secretions, as it shows here, can be your, um, some of your mammillary glands. So breast milk is somewhat, the cell is, yes, making a watery part, but it's also providing lipids from membrane phospholipids, proteins embedded in the phospholipids, and additional proteins and molecules that get sloughed off with the cell loss. All right? So it's, in some ways, it, it, it makes a little part of itself be lost to the secretion. Not the entire part, but a little part. So that's an apocrine secretion. A holocrine secretion, um, as they're showing you down here, is the cell kind of in making the secretion is going to completely, like, destroy itself. So it's going to completely make itself blow up, and everything inside of it is going to then be expelled out into the outside environment. All right? And so those cells have to constantly be replenished because as they blow and divide and throw out their internal contents to the extracellular environment of the duct, you are going to see that um, that cell can't survive that, so it has to then be replenished. All right. So for exocrine glands, some of our exocrine glands just make a little bit of a watery secretion, and that water means the cell lining is intact. 
and it gets put out there because the cell just throws and manipulates osmosis and um, small molecule populations. Apocrine secretions are going to be some of the cell is lost, but not all of it. Right, and the cell just kind of breaks off some of its membranes, some of its internal contents to be that secretion. The holocrine is the cell kind of gives itself up entirely. It'll either bust open and produce a, a secretion from its entire inside, or the entire cell kind of dies to um, to give that secretion up. All right. So again, those are examples of types of glands. So. Some of our mucus uh, serous secretions, our watery secretions are going to come from that merocrine type situation. Some of our mucus glands might be merocrine where we secrete ions and water, but we also add some like phospholipid and some mucin, some other special proteins that make it a little more slimy. That's your like um, salivary glands will do that. And then many glands are going to be kind of a mix of the two, all right? Uh, again, for this last little part on gland structure, I want you to be familiar with it, but I'm not going to expect you to be experts on this, all right? So for the most part, what a gland looks like is how long, is it one tube, is it multiple tubes that then interconnect, and the duct is that one opening that all of that tubing comes into play. All right, and so depending on what the, the tubing looks like, if it's branched, if it's circular, if it kind of makes one long little coil, that will be a simple gland with a single exit point, a single duct. If the duct is connected to like multiple little um, tree branching uh, mechanisms of multiple tubes connecting into each other, then you have a compound gland. All right, gang, I'm going to stop here because that's a lot of information. So this is epithelium. Next video is going to be connective tissue. And it's going to be another long video because it's a lot to cover. If you have questions, bring them to lab or send me a message through my email. All right, that's it for so far for today.